opportunities because um, a lot of that was done in consultation in, in events that we, the Chamber of Commerce, organised. Um, and I do think that some of the things there, um, creative, agri-food, marine, mining, aerospace, for example, um, play to uh, a proper um, combination of a public vision and a private psyche of Cornish people that sits quite comfortably with most of us as a direction of travel. So I think there are some things that we've got to say are um, going to play to our strengths and that hopefully markets um, will uh, enable us to, to, to grow and take advantage of um, as uh, the 21st century unfolds. So, for example, even before COVID came along, we knew that the reliance on fossil fuels, for example, and everybody commuting long, long distances to work and factory farming and these sort of things were not really sustainable practices anyway. And what this COVID crisis with far more people working from home um, with people being attracted to places like Cornwall, um, knowledge workers being able to work uh, from home here in ways that were never uh, the case before. Um, I do feel that there are some real long term market factors playing to Cornwall's strengths um, that have that have just not been there in previous um, uh, generations. Add into that a lot of what's emerged from this year with a very attentive and far better collaborative approach in a crisis between the private sector and the public sector. What's emerging um, in, in things that uh, I was asked to look at, like the sector mix. Well, if you look at Cornwall Council's what Cornwall wants, you'll see that there's a general um, uh, understanding from the resident population here that we've realised that the 32% um, of GDP, 30% of um, people employed and probably 40% of our businesses here because they, they are all small businesses reliant on tourism is not an ideal um, uh, reliance. It's having too many eggs in one basket when you do have a crisis like this. So uh, longer term, how do we move away from that over reliance on um, tourism is an issue. Uh, I was also asked to comment on economic performance. Um, very briefly, uh, the UK's productivity, um, that's the value of goods produced per person, is the worst of the, uh, e, uh, of the um, G7 uh, nations. Um, and against the UK index of 100, bearing in mind that that's already the worst of the uh, of our main competitors internationally, Cornwall's index stood at 72. Um, uh, and that's because not that we're lazier or any um, less desire to work here. It's that the um, four of the major industries we have here are notoriously patchy in productivity across the world. So um, hospitality, care, construction, agriculture, for example, um, go up and down in, in productivity during the day and during the week and during the year. Um, and they are large parts, as you as you have seen from the, the briefing notes this afternoon of our economy. So we're, we're saddled with that and we need to look at new ways in which um, technology and training um, of individuals um, can try and even out some of that economic um, uh, productivity imbalance that we've got uh, we've got here. I listened to a, 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 a talk last year by the chief economist of KPMG, who said that um, do he he put the question out there: Would we prefer a country where there is uh, low unemployment but low productivity? Again, which is UK against a country like France, where investment in IT, AI, robotics is much higher um, and productivity, therefore, is higher. But the uh, there is 40 or there was last year, 14 percent unemployment and that, that he was almost saying that there's a there's a quid pro quo there. Um, so what we need to do in places like Cornwall is to maintain high levels of employment. Um, but increase productivity uh, at the same rate. And that is something which the private sector is best placed to do, but which we need public um, sector to create the infrastructure to um, to help and a, a bit more of that um, later on. You have seen from your, your the, the notes that were provided, salary levels um, and so on are still considerably lower in Cornwall than they are um, in, in the national average. 
and that's because the productivity of those four key sectors and others um, means that our productivity here is, is lower and therefore wages uh, are lower. In terms of um, towns, I want to look at what role going forward they have as community hubs. Um, uh, I, I, I caught Victoria saying they weren't places which were just meant to be shops. Shops came to community hubs because there were people there. Um, and, and we've lost the, the role of towns as, um, as cattle markets and places where people would come into from rural areas to, to trade um, um, animals in that sense. So what are we going to do? We already in, in Cornwall Chamber of Commerce in 2019 had a reimagining our towns campaign and attracted some uh, internationally famous speakers to come and talk to us about what towns should look like. And this is very wrapped up here in the stats nationally that coastal towns suffer from in terms of um, fringe poverty, um, as well as the more fundamental basis. If retail dies in the same way that cattles have, cattle trading and markets have, what on earth are our towns going to be for? Um, and if we just um, you know, close up uh, towns as retail hubs. We're just gifting things to Amazon, and that you know, we all know that from these last few months of lockdown, um, we're all much more used to buying uh, products uh, online. What are our towns going to be? And I think you know, if we want them to be um, anything more than than health centres and culture and leisure centres, which perhaps is the way ahead, then we've got to look afresh at what. Um, living and working uh, patterns are allowed and, and planning um, is encouraged to, uh, to form in towns. And I'm very fearful that short termism exists in things like these four town deals that we've got in Cornwall. There's no long term 21st century strategy to look at what towns are going to be. We're, we're lurching from pillar to pillar, which feels a little bit like our, our life and uh, anyway at the moment. Um, with initiatives which aren't really thought through um, and I'd really like to look at uh, you know we've got beautiful towns here in Cornwall if you look at some of the already um, uh, distressed uh, high streets like uh, Cornish Hall Street in Halston or 4th Street in, in Red Ruth or 4th Street in Bodmin you know they're already suffering they were already suffering before this and we've got to work out a really long-term strategy they've relied on retail for 200 years um, if Amazon's going to nick that away from them what are they going to be to us uh, in the future um, I, I would like to say that the private sector um, needs to uh, markets need to drive uh, these things in, uh, in in many many ways what we look to the public sector whether that's Cornwall Council or national government to provide is the infrastructure in which business businesses can get on and do what they do best which is to um, is to make money create jobs and create long-term uh, prosperity so those are a few of the things I've got some further details on but I thought I'd leave some of that Hang in there, Peter, for people to uh, to question me on um, as to you know what particular areas of interest are uh, amongst councillors this afternoon. Okay, thank you, Kim. That's 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 wonderful. Um, uh, Kim, I'm sure you must know, but there there was an inquiry panel held at Cornwall Council uh, regarding the vitality of high streets, where uh, there was an awful lot of work gone into reimagining what, well, not reimagining actually trying to understand the issues that would face our high streets into the future uh, and, and I, I sat on that panel it was rather interesting because the, the, to put it in a very ultra simplistic way uh, I, I think we ended up drawing the conclusion that high streets were not necessarily going to be somewhere you would ne you'd think of going just to buy stuff so the simple transactional basis of, of what towns always traditionally have been is not going to be the future and the future is much much more likely to, to be based on um, experiences and, and experiential businesses offering stuff of that nature in town centres. Yeah. Um, and, and I think some of the work that was done in terms of making it the, the, the town's offer, which is coming out of Cornwall Council fairly shortly, was to offer individual towns the opportunity to seriously consider what their future might be, exactly as you say. But it sounds like you've got some ideas that might 
really need to be working hand in glove with what Cornwall Council are doing? Well, well I think obviously we, you know, we, we all live in Cornwall and we all live in the modern world. So we, we have got some of the same de data and stats coming to us all. And I think we shared some of the same speakers in our campaign. Um, people from Lord Grimsey's department who, who've done a lot of work on this in the past. Um, and, and I think there's um, there are some specific things which the uh, the public sector could do. For example, I believe there's a problem with the 1985 Landlords and Tenants Act about um, uh, the rights that a tenant has um, in an upstairs floor. So if they've got more than 50% of the floor space, they have what landlords, small landlords see as undue uh, rights. So I'd like to see thing, the public sector addressing specific things like that, and then some planning to enable the stairs to be built up the side of the, the shop as they, as they used to be, um, allowing access separately without going through the retail premises to uh, living quarters upstairs. And I think if you... I you know, don't think it's you know it's not doesn't take huge imagination if you had people living back in town centres you'd create some evening economy because people would be there there'd be people doing their their top up shopping and and so on and so forth and suddenly that there begins to get some uh, activity so I really would like to see really thought through um, changes changes in things like the landlord and tenant act and planning to enable people to live in towns and I think above the shop is a uh, a well-worn, um, you know, and happy theory for for British people. Um, living above the shop is is quite acceptable and would be ideal you know, first time affordable housing for for many people. I also think that what we what we historically have thought of as businesses that are conducted in um, rural workshops um, could be brought into town centres. Um, because actually they need, in some cases, less supplies delivered to them than, than you know, retail premises do. And I think they'd create interest and in some uh, things um, uh, that would be uh, a bit of a draw to people alongside, I think, the things that we've all come to the realisation of, of, of health um, you know, uh, health uh, activities, whether that be child health, um, mental health or, or age, uh, old age health. Um, and the culture and leisure um, activities, which uh, you know, which towns have got some track record in. I'd also like to just to, to, to play an influence, uh, sorry, uh, uh, an impact of towns, which is that when we're talking about, as, as Jane Pascoe and Victoria Vivian were earlier about the infrastructure, most of our towns do already have, you know, they're on bus routes and train stations and cycle paths and, and that sort of thing. So bringing people back into there, you don't have to create infrastructure from scratch that you would do if you're creating a new town uh, or whatever, perhaps, perhaps. So I think there are some, um, some several reasons for having hubs maintained. OK, thank you. Right, I'm going to now go to Councillor Mike McClenning, who looks rather like he might be appearing on Halloween shortly, but never mind. <laughs> oh, you're back, Mike. Hold on. I just my, I changed the seats because my back was aching. Um, very interesting, but I'm a, uh, I come from a private business background, um, a lot in publishing and working for publishers. Um, and having spent a long time working for Richard Desmond as a publisher, um, I get intrigued with the words that come out. Um, I might say something that you and I might fall out on, but it's not personal. It's just how my views are. I think the Chamber of Commerce to me is something you sort of thought about in the 1960s. Um, I don't see um, what influence you can have because, again, everything de uh, arrives or depends on the private sector here because you mentioned about the public sector can put the infrastructure in. Um, but it needs the private sector to be successful to create jobs. Um, I go back to earlier things. We're t forecasting that there's going to be 13,000 jobs going in Cornwall when this is over. Again, and I respect your honesty when you said about um, you've been working on all this before COVID, but it seems that COVID sort of focused people's minds on we've got a problem. You know, there's not enough work down here. There's not enough industry. Dirty, dirty, dirty. Um, I can't see, with even your experience, and like to be proven wrong, that you're going to attract mega companies down here to create proper employment. I don't mean about small jobs where they're going to take on two or three people, 
because two and three people, you've got to have a lot of them to get a, a huge number of staff. I think on the transport side, um, I lived in London for most of my life and I wouldn't use the underground and be safer than my car. But here where I live and many people, it, it, there's no transport and, it, and you can't hang around waiting for transport. And that's not your problem. That's the, that's the council's. And it's economic or doesn't make sense in some things because there's not enough people using the buses at certain times of the day. So there's not so many things. I I would rather, and I'm, I'm sure you're doing this really, so I've got to be uh, apologise to you. I would like you taking a forefront really with the private sector because you're closer to it than the council. And the council tell us, oh, they're working with and they're going to do training. How many people or officers have got the knowledge or the clout to deal with the private sector to influence their job appointments, how they create jobs and their training skills? Because they've been so long in the public sector. And when you're in the public sector, you're used to manana. I'm being really horrible here at the moment. But in the private sector, you have to give an answer yesterday when you're told something today. So there's a whole culture change that needs to happen now that COVID's sort of enlightened how we're all thinking. It's sad that it's had to happen like that, but I'm, I'm again concerned and I appreciate your honesty when you said about how it fluctuates, you know, the main three industries, you know, we're 70 percent, aren't we down against the, the norm of 100 or something like that. That that concerns me. And, you know, uh, perhaps if, I'm sorry if I hit you hard early on, but I'm sure you're doing something about that. But what can you do? I'd, I'm fed up with presentations at the council where they say about the theory. Oh, we're looking at this, re, uh, the recovery for Cornwall. One, no one knows that. We've got to wait and see the whole thing. We could be in shutdown completely soon. No one knows what that is. And I really want to see and support what's going to happen with real concrete work, if you like, not theory. Uh, and that's what I'm getting a bit fed up with all around because it's a hard decision to come out and say, yes, we're going to do this. But recovery, I should imagine it's going to go backwards for quite a while soon um, when Boris announces a, you know, a further shutdown. So I respect what you do. I'm sorry if I was a bit harsh. OK. Would you like to comment, Kim? Well, I wasn't quite clear what the dig at the Chamber of Commerce was at the beginning of that, but um, there, thereafter, um, I don't think Cornwall uh, is going to nor wants large businesses and the track record of the public sector body invest in Cornwall um, uh, not the Chamber of Commerce has failed to uh, get those here. I think if it was a, if it was led by the uh, by the Chamber of Commerce and the and the private sector, we would have had a lot more clarity on what sort of businesses we want here. And I don't think we are going to attract large businesses who've never had any previous um, connections with Cornwall. I think there are the possibilities to grow in this new world that I was talking about um, positively of where distance from markets is no longer the problem. If you look at some of our growing tech sector around um, Redruth, for example, there are businesses growing quite quickly and always looking to recruit um, software developers and programmers and, and so on and so forth. And those are the proper jobs of the 21st century, Mike. You know, they're not we're not looking at, um, at necessarily manufacturing. But if I also look at, for example, um, Lacoste, the clothing brand, yeah. the head office of Lacoste um, employs 88 people. They are a knowledge hub and the rest of the manufacturing, logistics, production, um, and so on and so forth is all outsourced. And that is the sort of high caliber jobs that I think we should be trying to attract to Cornwall. Not, not thousands in a manufacturing plant, but knowledge workers enabled by the internet um, and uh, encouraged by the beautiful surroundings to work in that we can provide here in Cornwall as a global hub where the, where the prosperity comes to Cornwall um, the, 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 the manufacturing, the logistics, the, the other bits of it can be done uh, elsewhere. As to your point about training, yes, we need to um, work very closely with how um, FE uh, funding um, is looked at. For example, you know, poor hairdressers get the bad rap here, but you know, we cannot, we, we, because Cornwall College gets a 
a sizable amount of money based on bums on seats in any particular year, it's easier for them to have 150 cohort of hairdressers than it is 10 aviation engineers looking to um, to, to, to staff the, um, the growing aerospace or space tech sector of the future. So FE funding, and you know, bear in mind we've got two really good FE colleges here in Cornwall, um, and now four universities. We are well blessed. If I, you know, my my opposite number in the Somerset Chamber of Commerce is very um, uh, envious of what we've got here, and that there's no university in Somerset, and 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 you know, so we've got the. The bones of a pretty good educational structure here. What we've got to look at nationally, more than more than Cornwall Council's problem, is how that is um, funded with long-term strategic aims in mind, uh, and not just um, being paid to put bums on seats um, this year. So there's some proper. Um, that's the sort of infrastructure that I'm referring to that the public sector needs to put in place to serve you know, to underpin what private sector can can do. And uh, it, it's it's a readjustment of that relationship that I'd like to see going forward. And I think Cornwall um, is leading. I, I maintain that I think Cornwall is leading on many uh, respects and, and was before uh, COVID. And I think if we can start all working together to, um, you know, to have an influence on, uh, uh, on on those sort of things, like uh, I say, further education, for example, then we we can be winners more quickly than uh, than other places, because people want to come and live and work here. Fair, no, no, I respect your answers. Are fair. Can I just ask you one quick question? I've asked this before to uh, Lady Victoria. Productivity in my world of productivity, it would be um, how we're going to bring more income into the company. Um, so, in your definition, if you just pick one industry, what would you like to see happen to improve the productive, productivity of that, comp that industry? Uh, for, first, that, that's a very interesting question. First and foremost, I'd like to see a complete rethink of how productivity is looked at. Yep. If we looked at um, a balance of lifetime productivity, um, or happiness as being a, an outcome of productivity, for example, Cornwall would feature far higher up the league table because um, you know we're not ever going to uh, do well. If, if you just th just think in the micro uh, world of one five star hotel of which we've got lots in Cornwall, the productivity there would be quite low per capita compared with you know, uh, a, a fast moving um, um, manufacturing plant somewhere else. So we're never going to, we're not comparing apples and apples. Um, and I would like to see the, the value added. Um, I'd like to see a lot more work done at academic level about how we look at productivity in the 21st century in terms of uh, well-being in the workplace, in terms of lifetime productivity, in terms of what's actually being uh, produced about um, uh, you know happiness in the workplace as I said earlier these sort of things I think these need to be calculate taken into a calculation and and then I believe um, we need to be listening to markets and letting our um, our agriculture sector our construction sector and so on charge what is a going rate for what's what it is they're producing you know if you speak to farmers they are fed up with just farming subsidies they want to be paid a fair w rate for what they are producing and in Cornwall you know we've got a really good mm -hmm. reputation in our food and, and drink and you know agri-tech agri is one of the LEPs 10 opportunities so our food offering here should be able to command a premium and I think it's that's that appreciation as we become as the consumer becomes um, the important person that unlike the mass produced homogenized products of the 20th century the, the stuff that we're producing in Cornwall needs to be able to command a premium price and then you'll get a, a far uh, a far fairer reflection of what productivity and and indeed you know wage levels will pick up at the same time. Okay, totally agree with your answer. Thank you. It's a, okay, private, so it's a private sector answer. Thank you. And I was, in I was in publishing as well, so I know I do. I've come across Rick Desmond and his, and his henchmen in the in the yeah. past. Yeah, yeah. I know them well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Least said about that, the better, quite possibly. Um, oh. Councillor Jim McKenna. Uh, Councillor Peter LeBroy, thank you. Uh, Kim, hi. Um, hi, Jim. Just a, just a couple of observations. You mentioned town deals and sort of, uh, and I'll be brief on this, Pete, don't worry. Um, you mentioned town deals and not thinking 
longer term. Uh, we have done quite a lot of spatial planning in Penzance using Levine Lonsdale uh, and the place shaping group. So we are fairly well placed, we think, without being complacent to do more than just patch uh, patch things up. Um, I agree. One of the things we're looking at is exactly what you talked about, build, uh, bringing not just upper stories into use, but uh, potentially shrinking the town centre as well, um, so that we can make more of the buildings and accommodate more people. And by implication, uh, more people are there in a position to support the nighttime economy and the shops and such. So I think I would agree with your thinking on that. Um, from a personal perspective, I think the more independence we have in terms of not just councillors, but shops, um, I think would be a good thing because you go to Totnes, you go to some places, they seem to be riding COVID quite well uh, because other than the outskirts of the town, they're full. Uh, we've got more independence now in Penzance than we had five years ago. And from my perspective, I think we need to plan for having fewer banks, fewer nationals and filling those spaces with other things. So giving people a reason, a different reason to come into town. So that links me on to, uh, I guess, the, the hinterland and the uh, part of the reason we're here. Um, what would you do, what would you suggest, um, car parking is going to be one of them, but what would you suggest would encourage more people into towns so that um, they could sort of spend there, but also potentially that would that would generate some of the wealth which we need um, sort of around the place too. So if you had two things, leaving aside car park charges, because we all agree on those, um, what would you do to encourage people in, but also in a way which would benefit those who live out, out with the towns? Well, I think it's um, the, the first thing is um, Peter Lebroy, uh, Councillor Lebroy, you referred to earlier is, um, you know, what are what are the towns going to be that want to what are the things in there that bring people in? And it's an experiential thing. It's what the you know, in sim very simple terms is what the Internet can't provide, isn't it? That's that's what we've got to be thinking about. And that's. Uh, and that's the sort of shops that you've got in Chapel Street in Penzance and uh, Arwenick Street in Falmouth and other places where people want to come and experience uh, what's going on. So I think there will there'll always be a place for those in, in amongst the other uh, cultural and leisure activities, which actually we're very strong on in Cornwall if we think about it. And those corralled could be uh, could be a much stronger reason to come into uh, towns. If we look at places like Truro, the reason why there's no evening economy in Truro is that the infrastructure doesn't work. There used to be when, um, you know, 15 years ago, there were two or three uh, nightclubs and a proper sort of, you know, hub of, of reasons to go into Truro uh, in the evening. Um, and what what one of the many problems was that taxis became far too expensive. So the actual getting people in and out of that hub um, wasn't wasn't very um, easy. Just, just put in those simple terms that we'd all be able to understand. So, I think if you want a place to be, um, you know, busy during the day and busy for different reasons during the evening, it's got to be accessible, hasn't it? And um, you know, I, I worked through this with Nigel Blackler and Glenn Williams on on parking last year. So I'm fully aware of the conflicting. Um, reasons for you know some people want more cars in so that they think they'll bring more people in some people want less cars in some people want other forms of transport and so on and so forth so i know that's a knotty problem which you know the council um has to deal with it's a big revenue stream to the council and yet it's not very forward thinking and you know it's a, it's a big problem so I, I think accessibility by as many routes as we can Buses, um, smaller buses, more 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 agile buses um, and bus routes, uh, using the towns as desirable, experiential, safe, happy, um, lively, brightly lit places to come and visit day and night. I think um, uh, is is a really you know uh, and there's there's I, I I'm conscious Jim that I'm saying lots of things in one place there you know to make a place brightly this is expensive to make it desirable in the evenings is um, takes a lot of businesses to um, to come together to to do that but I think there's a there are directions of travel and there are planning and um, uh, and and uh, initiatives which the the council can do, which would really put the infrastructure in place that businesses would then would then follow to do. And I and I I think I think that is desirable. I think young people will not be uh, locked up 
for forever. I think those of us uh, who uh, are desperate to go and eat and and drink and go to the theatre and yeah. you know everything that we've missed over the last few months will come back with some zest um, as we as we go forward. We're not going to return to anything as we go forward to a new set of um, circumstances and things. I think that there will be things that towns beautifully. Um, laid out towns like we've got in Cornwall will appeal to people and I think they're just going to be first and foremost accessible. Okay, thank you. For the, for the avoidance of doubt I am extremely positive about the opportunities Covid brings so in terms of uh, making change so. Yeah some of the some of the changes are definitely right for Cornwall and, and, yeah. and playing to our strength and, and I think the town deals you referred to at the beginning um, are you know they are a catalyst if we can take on what we're learning properly from COVID and apply it in the town deal thinking, then that does give a good guidance for, for what's going to happen in the future. Agree. Right. Okay, th th thank you, Jim. Thank you, Kim. Um, I, I'm, I'm acutely aware that we're sort of veering away from rural um, places of living into towns um, as, as places of living. Um, and, and this inquiry is actually really all about the uh, those rural environments. Um, obviously, Kim, your your experience is probably going to be focused more towards the the town. So I, I totally accept that. And um, now um, I've introduced the other two councillors as councillors, so it'd be entirely wrong of me not to invite Councillor Jane Pascoe to say a few words and interact with you, Kim. <laughs> hi, hi, Kim. Uh, Kim and I have known each other for some time, so okay. I think Jane's perfectly fine. Uh, thanks, um, Peter. Um, just very quickly, and I will just quickly pick up on that car parking business. Just an observation and information I got through the COVID situation. We had free parking in Lisgard. We had a greengrocer butcher, uh, a fishmonger operating throughout the COVID um, lockdown, um, providing really good service for um, customers who, who, who needed to get um, their basic essentials. The car parking was free. They were delighted that the baker butcher thing were there and they used them with that free car parking. The car parking was uh, fees were charges were reintroduced um, and actually the traders took it as a punishment really and they'd been so brave doing that. Um, the minute they were reintroduced not only the fear of touching the keypads and handling coins to put in the car park but killed it st st the town stone dead and people then reverted back to going to the supermarket. So Show me a free car park and I'll show you a busy town. And there is no doubt about that. And I've been saying that and I'm going to harp on again for 46 years. Um, you know, there, there must be free shoppers car parks, I think, even if some of them are, you know, for, for other things that people pay. So there we go. That's that's my view on that. And um, yeah, I, I, I want to take it back to um, originally this piece of work is, is that how I believe that what goes on in the hinterlands of the towns, whether it's a rural hinter hinterland or whether it's coastal, um, makes a difference to, to, to that town and the economy of that town and the resonator of that town. As you know, Liscard is surrounded by an agricultural hinterland. We've got a very green hinterland. And I just wonder what you feel. I, I, again, I've been listening to the promotion of Cornwall throughout COVID. I've heard Malcolm Bell um, talking on the national TV and the news. I don't think we're promoting green tourism enough, which would make a huge, make a really vibrant rural economy. And, and, and in that green tourism, what I actually mean is walking, hiking, camping, pony riding, golf, all those activities which people have now become very quite health conscious. They all want to have exercise. They're not going abroad so much. All those sort of things could make a massive difference to the economy in those rural hinterlands, which will then impact on the towns that are the service centres for those areas. And I just feel Cornwall misses a trick there because we have our own outstanding natural beauty. We don't need theme parks. We do have Eden. But apart from that, we really are have some very beautiful areas and people are now rediscovering those sort of areas. And I think maybe that's something that will help these market towns that are, are, are failing. Um, you mentioned about not having the cattle markets and things. 
We're running, you have pop-up shops. We have pop-up sheep sales in Liscard. We can attract a thousand sheep. They're seasonal ones, so it has to be the right time of year. But, but, but farmers come along with a thousand sheep. I don't think it's right that the centralization of these markets actually on the Devon border for us um, are, are actually helping either because these farmers have got small amounts of stock. They want to get them to market and they haven't got all day to go traveling against our climate policies um, all the way up there to do that business. And those towns are service centers for those farmers, the accountants, the uh, solicitors, the uh, all architects, all those sorts of services that are there because of the agricultural hinterland. And I just wondered what your view, you know, I, I heard you say all well, the cattle market, but, but there is still a need for some of these markets. Not all, a lot of it's done online and the bigger farmers do it online, but the smaller ones still want to bring 20 sheep in a link box to a market and sell them. And they want to see people and talk to them. And I think that, and that was what used to make the town's busy on market days is, is those people coming in. So I, I think that's, you know, I, I think it's a retrograde step to have them all so far away and, and hardly any left now in Cornwall and smaller markets. Mm -hmm. They're not, it, it would need to be a function that just didn't cater for livestock, but could also cater for dead stock, a rural hub, if you like, all that sort of thing. But I think that's important and could be important to some towns as well, in particular Liscard. Um, and that's really sort of bringing it back to how important it is for the outlying areas to make an impact on the survival of those towns, as opposed to just having the towns with shops in them. And I'll also say, and often the people in my division, are, I've, I've got quite an ageing population in, in, in Liscard Western Dog Walls. Um, I, I can go into Dog Walls Village and if I say to them, if you go on the website for Cornwall Council and their eyes roll back in their heads and they say, we don't do the internet. So nobody is asking those people if they still want to shop in a town. Mm. They don't They don't all go online. They don't all have their, sh their, their shopping delivered. They do still use the town. Um, and, and until that... that generation dies out then we still need to cater for them and and I don't think we must forget them and keep looking ahead and saying we're not we're not going to to offer those services I, I think that would be a mistake but I just wonder what your view on that all of that Kim was well, well thank you Jane yes and, and it's uh, it's interesting to make that reconnection which which I did at the beginning you know and and, and you know we have got slightly distracted from uh, uh, as as you said Councillor Broy about um, the, the rural hinterland I see that very much as being a community hub for that rural hinterland um, and you'll be pleased uh, Jane to know that um, sustainable tourism is a phrase I use all the time and that Malcolm Bell has got some budget post half term to promote exactly uh, that for, for breaks in the latter half of the autumn. So he's he's got a campaign to work work um, on uh, Made in Cornwall Mondays, uh, Culture Tuesdays, Walkie Wednesdays, Foodie Fridays and things to make sure that people realise that if they come out of the summer season, there are things other than beaches uh, in Cornwall that they will really enjoy um, at other times of the year. So sustainable tourism is something we're all working towards and let's make no bones about it it means um fewer number of people spending more money when they come here and some of the top end of the uh hospitality industry that we've been growing over the last um 15 years here in cornwall um really does help to do that and then going on to the reasons for coming into town um i'm not going to comment on the parking <laughs> thing um because that's a that's a knotty problem. But in reasons uh, for coming into town, we you know we do have these things called farmers markets, um, and if they could be, um, if the the framework of those farmers markets could be expanded by um, policy from Cornwall Council, so that not only did farmers bring their um, produce in, but could in one sector perhaps bring the uh, livestock in if that were, if there was still a market for that, then 
that would be a reason for those um, people in the rural hinterlands to come and enjoy their community centre um, at least one day a week. So perhaps we should look at making um, more of a champion of the farmers markets and seeing where they actually could uh, in a Venn diagram coincide with what uh, what you and I think of as markets, Jane, in, in the older sense. And uh, that would be quite an interesting way to look at that because you know it was market forces that did for cattle markets and livestock markets generally um, in the frequency that they used to take place in all of our market towns. So, but if we could recreate that hub of the community by being you know, one day a week or perhaps different sectors of the of the uh, rural communities coming into towns uh, on different days of the week, then that would bring some interesting uh, dynamics to the towns. Um, and going back to Councillor McKenna's uh, question, they've still got to be accessible. And if part of that is if part of that is um, free parking, is part of part of that is free parking for the for the uh, particularly for the people coming in with who live in postcodes uh, in the surrounding hinterland, then there'd be an interesting discussion to be had there, I think. So uh, that that is something that perhaps uh, we, we could look at private and public sector working together on. OK, right. Thanks very much. That, thanks for your questions, panel. Um, Kim, in your opening gambit, you talked about or in fact, you gave the impression that actually there was potentially quite a bright future for Cornwall with opportunities unlocking due to the I guess you call it a re-empowerment of the consumer, the fact that people wanted to buy bespoke stuff and experiences that we actually were very well positioned to provide in Cornwall. So I was very grateful for that description from you. Um, all of our um, uh, people that we've had coming forward this afternoon, we've asked two questions, one of which is how important do you believe the town is to the businesses and people living in rural communities and vice versa? How important are rural communities to the towns? And also, could you then provide us with a wish list of three or four um, interventions that Cornwall Council could consider uh, in order to ensure the vitality of these rural areas into the future? Thank you, uh, Councillor Broy. Yes, on the, fir on the first point, um, t people say, you know, is the high street dead? Well, the high street, I think they mean by that, is retail dead. The high streets we've got in Cornwall are beautifully... A beautiful architecture um, and uh, and great places. It's not like a children's toy that we've grown out of. We are going to have to do something with them. So that that is the starting point. We're not we're not going to knock all our towns down um, with the wonderful uh, roads that we've got there. So for, first and foremost, we have to find something to do with those uh, with those high streets. And um, you know, we all need to apply all of our understanding for what the 21st century is going to unfold as for what that is going uh, to be because um you know they, they are there they're not something that we can um pack up and uh, and and you know take to the dump or whatever so it's going to have to be something pretty long term that that bricks and mortar that 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 um beautiful uh, town centers that we associate with cornwall's towns is going to have to be used for so I, I would like to um, think of two things, really, that I think uh, I've already touched on. One is a, um, a, a really clear and communicated. When, when I was preparing for this discussion this afternoon, I asked around the office um, what uh, they think we should be uh, looking for. Um, what, the two clearly things, clear things run out. One was... Um, infrastructure and by that when I pushed them they meant um, accessibility transport and of course more importantly for where Cornwall's future is going to be is a digital infrastructure so um, ultra fast broadband not relaxing on our laurels that we've got good super fast we need to push ahead to ultra fast broadband that's going to be the currency of future businesses um, and uh, and uh, 5g so you know both of both of those things we need to look at very carefully that is that is infrastructure which i think the public sector can um position so that the business businesses can then get on and do what they uh, what they want um, and the second thing that pe people mentioned was communicating so you know if if after events like this there is a very clear strategy for town centers as hubs for their rural hinterlands then that's got to be communicated in very straightforward accessible language to the people that we're trying to uh, influence 
um, and make sure that that is um, uh, is you know understood by all the people that um, that that uh, that that all all of the councillors have asked me questions this afternoon, obviously from their own um, perspectives, have looked at so that the, those people, whether they be people who are not on um, on Cornwall Council's website or whether they're people coming into the town from uh, rural hinterland or whether they're people in the town as, as councillor mckenna referred to um you know trying to do things better or as as uh, councillor mckenning said you know people people who are have a, a different understanding of what businesses and and infrastructure looks like so let's really communicate what we're doing so for me it would be a really long-term strategy for the infrastructure still using our towns as the hubs if we if we envisage in our mind's eye uh, a town with bus routes and cycle paths and roads coming into that infrastructure with more people living in there with a different sort of um, uh, business uh, in there then i would like to uh, see that being far clearly more clearly communicated and i think visually that's a very interesting and exciting and um, easy way to uh, to picture that. Um, and the second thing I would like to see is that the other LEP uh, 10 opportunities alongside uh, agriculture and tourism are provided with the infrastructure from the public sector to really flourish uh, in Cornwall in ways that we would uh, dream of. So if we think of what we've got in tourism terms we've got wonderful green spaces we've got a wonderful coastline we've got wonderful cultural heritage we've got wonderful artistic uh, places to go uh, in agriculture we've got some of the best um, land uh, in the world some of the best sea in the world so we've got fantastic food um, that's coming and those two things i think will remain uh, champions of uh, cornwall but i think if we could build up some of the um, in infrastructure like that, the best, the best possible infrastructure, for example, for renewable energy, um, for lithium and geothermal production, then I think we'd see a, a future where um, what Cornwall wants is findings that we want to spread our um, uh, uh, reliance on tourism out to other things. I think that would happen if we had the same sort of first class uh, infrastructure the first class framework that we that we've given ourselves in in agriculture fisheries and tourism over many years i think i think you're mute uh councillor that sorry that old, you, that old uh, online the error <laughs> Um, Kim, we're incredibly grateful for your time this afternoon. Thank you for hanging out on and sorry that we were late getting you kicked off. It's been very, very interesting to hear from you. Uh, and I think if there's one thing I'm going to take away from the piece that you've given to us is that the towns play a very important part of supporting the rural economies and uh, we mustn't lose sight of that throughout this process. I think that would be a fair, fair comment, yeah. Okay. Thank so you, thank, we'll you. That. thank you. Say so, thank you. Um, and I think we're going to draw this, this section to a close. But I just want to ask Lynn, just to be double sure, we're going to reconvene immediately after in a separate meeting. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Chairman. Um, I've sent around a separate link so um, we can then close this meeting and then we enter into the other link for the informal discussions. OK. Right. OK, so, so councillors, we'll keep it as quick as possible. Kim, thank you. We'll say goodbye. We need to drop out of this meeting and enter into the other meeting, which hopefully won't take more than five minutes or so, and then we can call it a day. OK, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim. Nice to see you again. Take care.